Good afternoon. I come to you today in a rather solemn mood. I've got a lot on my mind. I've been up early praying and I didn't sleep last night. I got an old song in my spirit and my, my spirit just sang it to me all night long. What do you want the Lord to say? What do you want to hear the Lord say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I've been singing that all night, didn't sleep much, but we, uh, we've got a lot to pray about today, so I don't want to linger around and then want to get to some word, and um, and I don't know where we're going to go. We may do a lot of word, you know, we're capable of that, uh, but I've got much I need to talk to you about real quick, <clears throat> and I don't want to uh, linger. I want to say thank you for everything you give. I thank all of you that have given some extra lately. I want to encourage you all to begin to give a little extra. We've taken on a new project. And uh, I thank all of you for your giving, and I pray that the Lord richly reward you for your giving. I'm not trying to chisel you out of money. You all know me better than that. But I want to say thank you. Always thank you, because everything I own is, is because you sacrificed, and that means something to me. It means a great deal to me. Uh, you're going to have to excuse me a second. Lord, I need some handkerchiefs. I didn't bring myself any handkerchiefs. You'd hand me three or four out of my drawer. No, in the bedroom. And forgive me for that. But I, uh, I've i been tied up praying all morning. I received a very urgent prayer request just a few minutes ago from my little neighbor down the street, Miss Carr. And <clears throat> I... Um, Uh, she's the lady with cancer, and her daughter has asked us to pray for her. She's, uh, her daughter uh, said that Miss Carr is hanging on, and that they're kind of wanting her to stop being in pain is the main thing. I know they're not trying to get rid of the mother, but um, we, um, I told them I'd come over as soon as we got through here today. <clears throat> so we're going over to do one or two things: either release her into the hands of Jesus for all of eternity or see God work a miracle, which is what I'd much rather see happen. It is time for us to quit giving up every time it gets tough. It is time for us to quit throwing in the towel. So we're going to pray in a moment. We've been praying for Lori's dad. Got a good report this week that the doctor said there's a chance they might be able to reverse some, some procedures they've done on him that perhaps his body is healed. We won't know for a month, but I need your prayers. He needs a miracle, and we need a miracle for him. And for my own mother, we need to continue to pray and pray for Lori's mom and my, my dad that they would have strength. I want to just say thank you for all the wonderfully kind things you've said about just me kind of pouring out my heart last week and just letting you know what it means to truly be saved. And I did all that so that you would know um, that it doesn't matter how messed up you are or how goofy of a kid you are or how jacked up as an adult you are, there's still hope. We're praying for Stevie Barwick that uh, he is has been incarcerated and they're talking about letting him out Monday and he doesn't need to get out. He's still got some real serious problems and we need Jesus to intervene. He has promised me that he will intervene and that we will see that child sitting at the feet of Jesus and clothed and in his right mind. And I'm not letting go of the promise of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Always for my friend Shirley, Pastor Wayne Powers' wife has finished her first week of treatments. They have done a new MRI and we won't get the results back till Monday, but I'm looking for them to say, my goodness, everything's gone and we don't even know what happened. We are looking for miracles. We are a people of miracles. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for miracle. You wouldn't still be alive if God had not intervened for you. We're looking for the miraculous today. And so we're going to pray and we may pray a little while, then we'll get to the word. But Father God, you know, I've been talking to you today now about all these things. We need a miracle for Miss Amy Jo Carr. We need a miracle for Stevie Barwick. We need a miracle healing for Shirley Malott, for Bill Martin, for my mother, 
for Kathy Powers and for Carl Powers. Lord Wayne's nephew is very ill and he's not ready to meet you. We must have you to intervene in his behalf and save that boy's soul and heal his body. Now, Lord, today, you know, I need wisdom. I always need wisdom, but I need a special wisdom. I'm going into a strange place in a few minutes, and I'm going to go in in the authority of the word of God and by the power of God. And I need you to go before me, go with me, be underneath me, be on top of me, be all around me, and let thy kingdom come and thy will be done in that house. We are looking for a display of your power. All morning long, looking at that fifth chapter of Luke, I saw the power of God was present to heal. I know that the power of God is present to heal this very moment. Hallelujah. Lord, I want to thank you for what you're doing in me. What you're doing in me in these classes on Thursday night is nothing short of a brand new walk with you. I felt a new valve open up in my soul and it come gushing out this past Thursday. God, I pray that you'd give me the wisdom to walk in a new overflow. I pray you'd give me the wisdom to walk in a new gully washer. God, I pray that you would search the conduit of our lives. Search me and try me. See if there be any wicked way within me. Deliver me from secret faults. Deliver me from hidden sins. Deliver me from the sin of presumption that it might not lead to the greater iniquity. God, I need you today. I need the anointing that makes preaching easy and effective. God, I need a miracle for Kathy Powers. I need a miracle for Shirley Malott. I need a miracle financially for several people. Lord, you know who they are. Lord, Lori and I need a miracle. We need a housing miracle. We need an automobile miracle. We need a miracle in this situation in Mississippi. We come today a needy people. We come today making a draw on the anointing. We come today to make a withdrawal from the word of God that has been deposited into our lives. We have many needs present here today. God, we need an overflow of the overflow. Need my mama, need Bill, need Frida and my dad to be touched and strengthened. And Wayne, he's tired, Lord, I can tell it. Be with him and undergird him. And Lord, undergird every caregiver out there. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Mighty, powerful name. Name above every name. Exalted name. Unlike name. You are the great unlike one. There is none like and unto you. Come, O Holy Spirit, and all our hopes renew. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to hallelujah to God. Glory, 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 glory. My God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your power. Thank you, Lord. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. It's a passage you all know quite well. When I became a Christian 37 years ago. We celebrated it last week. And if you ever get tired, if you ever see me get tired of talking about it, you let me know because I'm not going to get tired anytime soon of talking about being brought out of hell and brought out of destruction. But I touched a little bit on it last week when I first got saved. First scripture I ever learned was Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And when I first got saved, they were trying to put me in prison for the rest of my life. And you had to seek the Lord or die. 
So I came in under different circumstances than all of you. But I had to cling to this word. And the second scripture I ever learned was Isaiah 26 and 3. He will keep thee in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusted in thee. And then I learned John 14, 27. My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth, my peace. The Jews have a term for that. They call it leave talking. We Southerners are bad about that. When we start to say goodbye from somebody's house, about an hour later, we're out the door. And they were the same way. I think they got it from us. The uh, He left talking. What did he leave talking about? About peace. About the Holy Spirit. About coming to his house. And I learned John 16, 33. These things I've spoken unto you. That in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. But they taught us this scripture. They taught it to us and they taught us the meaning of it. And I had a pastor that didn't let me play around and dilly-dally when it came to the word. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, are becoming new, one translation said. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, all my good Baptist friends will remember being an ambassador for Christ. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. A new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, I sat this morning, and in a short period of time, I just started doing some writing. And I wrote down a few things, and I want to tell you some things about why I'm still in the faith. And we'll just call this sermon this morning a new creation, because I am a new creation. You see, we go through all the wonderful things the Lord has promised to do new. And I tell you, go on over to Ezekiel 36. It'll do you good to go there. Uh, Ezekiel 36 is, is a scripture I've always just loved so much, so it won't hurt you to learn to love it too. Ezekiel 36, about verse 26, I think. Let me look. Yes, sir, there it is. Go to 25. For I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit. Will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Hallelujah. Sprinkled, clean. I can't tell you what it felt like to me when I got saved to just be clean. It, it was quite overwhelming, the fact that I was clean. I had been a filthy little monster for so long. And, you know, I, it just was so new to me. I, I can't tell you. You know, I tell these things that people think I'm lying, but I'm not. I literally didn't think about married people wearing wedding rings. Yeah, I wasn't stupid. I guess I knew they did. But, you know, the world I came out of, it never seemed to matter a whole lot. And I didn't know that, you know, I, I knew that we went out in the heavy part of traffic to uh, go do nefarious things so we could blend in. But it really never occurred to me to get up and go to work at 8 o'clock and get off at 5 or go whenever you went 7. When I went at 7 when I got say never occurred to me i remember when the first year came around they said well you've got to fill out your income tax and i said why 
He said, well, because you're going to get some money back. I said, I like that. I said, they're going to give me money. They said, no, they're going to give you your money back from paying in too much. I said, oh, well, I like that too. I remember being so green. I remember when I first got saved, I would hear people and they were talking about things I didn't really understand. They, uh, they talked about, will you accept Jesus as your savior? I don't think that's in the Bible. And I got to studying and looking and found out it wasn't in the Bible. Will you accept him as your Lord and Savior? That's in the Bible. Is he your master? Does he rule and reign? Do you have a new heart? Do you think different? You see, I was taught very early on, and I'm just going to be kind of scattergunning, so you just bear with me. And we know that we have a new heart, but then we came along, and in Luke 5, he said you can't put new wine in an old bottle. So something's got to change. Got to get a new bottle. Well, that's a new creation, a new heart, a renewed mind. And so I need the new wine of the Holy Spirit, and his spirit does dwell in all of us who are born again. His spirit abides in us, Romans 8, 9, Romans 8, verse 9, verse 8, chapter 8 and verse 16, lest a man have the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And so I, I have that spirit in me, and you should have that spirit in you if you're born again. And I've always wondered about something, why people who claim to be born again fight so hard against the Holy Spirit. I never did understand that. And they'll even go so far as to say that those of us who speak with tongues are of the devil. And I never did understand how there could only be one Holy Ghost and you say he lives in you and yet you go and say I'm of the devil because he lives in me. I don't get that. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't believe like that. And, um, you know, I don't believe we have to agree on every minutia, but we must get the basics right. If you believe the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, by grace, through faith, then so be it. I read this morning, J. Henry Jowett. He said, if you take the grace of God and mix it with the faith of man, it can change the entire human race. I thought I'd believe every word of that. We need an outpouring of the grace of God. And I want to just give you a little quick admonition. On Thursday nights, if you're not attending this Zoom class, I want you to hear me. You're missing it. All your excuses and all your foolishness that you've come up with to not be there is silly. You are missing an opportunity for a powerful encounter with God. It is literally gushing in that Thursday night class. It is doing something for me and everybody that's taking it. One young lady said it's like swimming in pudding. Now, I want to talk to you about getting saved. And so when I first got saved, you see, this thing was all new to me. And I remember I, I, I didn't really want to raise my hands in church. I thought people would see me and they'd laugh at me. And finally, I, I started slipping my hand up. And then it kind of became like a lightning rod. By the time I got my hands up, the presence of the Lord would come down. And we used to sing that as the praises go up, the blessings come down. And I would praise him and and, and then I, I got to the point that I couldn't help but praise him. You see, because he had new wine in a, in a, oh, in a new bottle. And his, the, the wine of the spirit was intoxicating, just to be quite honest. It was quite overwhelming. And, and drinking too much of it, you'll start seeing things nobody else sees. And you'll start hearing things from another world that they're not tuned into. And your walk will be different because you'll walk by faith and not by sight. And your joy will be different. You'll be awfully happy if you're a new creation. The Bible said even the angels in heaven rejoice the day you got saved. Why shouldn't you? I never have understood the gloominess of religion. Even in the book of the Revelation, which everybody's so afraid of, nine woes in the book of Revelation, nine woes in 22 chapters. But there are 10 songs. You see, the good will always outweigh the bad. And I didn't say you're going to tiptoe through the tulips, and I didn't say it's going to be a cakewalk. 
I said that he'll give you a song, even a song in the night, Job told us. The Apostle Paul proved it at the Philippian jail. A new song. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And when I got saved, I started worshiping. They told me some things back then. They said that now you got to, uh, let's go look at this. You, you need to see this. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Uh, I, I want you to get this. This is powerful, powerful, powerful. And because I want you to get it, because this is something that we got to talk about. So I'm going to help you to know whether you've really ever been saved or not, or if you just got excited and got baptized all over again. A lot of people do that. And let's go to 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, that means a bad attitude, Ugh. and all guile, that means being a con man, and hypocrisies, that means wearing a mask. And envies, will be envious, all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so, or since you have, he said, have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Earnestly desire. Now let's talk about being born again, okay? Now here's what happens when you get born. The situation that has been sustaining you and feeding you, the symbiotic fluids, the umbilical cord, your mother's um, womb, um, has been sustaining you, okay? But then there comes a day of pain, and women begin to travail. That's the word that's used in the Bible, travail, and that's when they hate their husbands and everybody else for a little bit. And they begin to travail. And then the baby comes forth and the Bible teaches us that once the child is there, they forget all about the pain. And I don't know if that's true or not. I've had a few tell me they still remember it. Uh, I believe the Bible, what it says, don't get me wrong. But it's that way spiritually. When I got saved, I was in a tight spot, a bad tight spot. But I want you to understand something. I never once got saved thinking I'd get off drugs, I'd get I'd keep going to jail, or I'd become a preacher or anything else. Never crossed my mind. But the moment that I got saved, I picked up that Bible. And I want you to listen to me good. When a child is born in the natural, there's a bursting forth. And that child comes forth, and the first thing they do is cut that umbilical cord to release it from the old feeding tube, if you will, that was nourishing it. That's why we turn away from the people we ran with. The systems, the people, the, the things we did, we quit. Had to be cut off. And it had to be cut off because we would have still tried to dabble in it. But he cut it off. And I'm not feeding there anymore. All right, now, then you're going to take that baby and clean him up. You're going to clean him up all on the outside, but you're going to clean all that mucus out of his nose and get all those symbiotic fluids out. And, and then you're either going to pinch him or, or pop him on the booty where he'll breathe and take in a deep inspiration. <gasps> And we breathe the rarefied air that we're not used to. And I began to breathe heavenly air. And I began to breathe pure air. And I began to breathe, breathe, breathe the freshness of his breath. Now listen to me. Now I've been cleaned up. I've been separated. I've got the gunk out of me. No where ever in the history of time do you have to teach a baby where to go nurse? It's as natural to them because they newborn babes desire, and I got to tell you that word says crave, and I love that. It says crave the pure milk of the word. Crave the pure milk of the word. Now I got to be real brutally honest. I've never met that many people that truly craved the word of the Lord. I've never met that many people, especially way on up the trail, 30 years, 40 years, 
that are just devouring the word of God and learning. I told my wife this morning, I said, the more I study, the more I want to study, the more I read, the more I want to read. It's called the law of progression. And the reason most of you don't understand your Bibles, you don't crave it. The reason most of you know more about politics than you do God is you spend too much time watching the news. And I'm going to say it to you plain. Jesus of Nazareth is the savior of this country, not whoever you seem to think it might be. And the only hope we have is Jesus. And you need to get your eyes off whichever political party you got them on. Get your mind back on the Lord. And if you'd seek the Lord like you seek information about some political conspiracies, you'd be in a whole lot better shape. I'm just going to say it plain. To sincerely desire the pure milk of the word. I, I got to tell you, this is my number one factor for you know these things, just what new birth looks like. I, I'm afraid most people are not saved because they've never been cut off from the past. They've never been cleaned up. They still have malice and envy and, and guile. They're still trying to con you. They're hip hypocrites. They wear a mask trying to pretend to be something new they're not. Let me tell you, when I became new, everybody in the whole world used to call me pilgrim. That's all they called me, pilgrim, pilgrim, pilgrim. But when I got saved, everybody started calling me Robert. Now, for the last so many years, they've called me pastor for so long, I've almost forgotten my name but it's a new name. Well, okay, that's biblical. He gives new names. He gave Abram a new name, gave Jacob a new name, gave me a new name. Bible said that we have a new name written on a white stone in Revelation, a new name. And that means they're not calling me the same thing they used to call me. They used to call me thief and liar and criminal and violent, and dopehead. But now they're saying, look at that. Look at that. When I first got saved, there was a conspiracy by a, a, a group of people. I won't call their names or tell their occupation, but they had a conspiracy out to kill me. They were going to do away with me because they thought I was so rotten and vile. Lady that discipled me, her son had been a member of that group and he spoke to them and he said, I want you to give him a year. He said, he said, I, I know he's got it coming, but give him a year. And so I began to grow in grace. I began to have a new name. They had me on Christian television. and I mean, they had me on secular television, secular radio programs. I even took my little old mama on television. We went on and we told everybody there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And I had a new name if I was a new creature. And I sincerely desired the pure milk of the word. I remember even Dr. Nunley told me early on, I asked him a rather in-depth question. He said, why do you even know that? I said, because I'm reading and studying. He said, that's wonderful. But I want you to enjoy being saved. I said, I am enjoying being saved by reading and studying. It's not a drudgery. I delight to do thy will, O Lord. It's not a routine. It's not a rut. It's delight. It's a delight. Now, I want to tell you, one of the first things I learned is there are five levels you can live life on. I hope you write this down and keep it for a thousand years. The first level is it's absolutely wrong. The second level is eh, it's not good, but you know, maybe not so bad. The third level is there's nothing wrong with it or neutral. The next level is it's pretty good, good stuff. And then there's the best level. But you listen to me well. If you're living your life on a level of, well, I don't see nothing wrong with it, you'll never live on the best level. If you're living your life on the, well, the Lord forgives. He, he no, no, the Lord does not forgive willful sin. I'm sorry. That's not in the Bible. And you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and call it repentance. It's not repentance. I had a young lady tell me this week, I don't call her name, but she said, if a year ago you had told me that I would have the intimate encounters with God that I'm having right now, it would have seemed foreign to me. 
And she said, yet he has become so real to me through these classes on Thursday and through listening and applying the word of God, craving the word of God. She said, it's overwhelming. And I said, yes, I have felt that way for many, many years. And then he said, we, we not only get a new name and we have new wine. He said, but you speak with new tongues. He said in Mark 16, he said, that'll be one of the signs you speak with new tongues. Now, I'm not going to get into glossolalia. We won't even discuss that this morning. But I spoke with a new tongue right off the bat. I quit lying. To the best of my knowledge, I've never told a willful lie in 37 years. If I lied, it was surely by accident. I'm not going to say I've been perfect, but I, I did stop lying. God, that's all I did before I got saved. And I stopped cursing. God, I cursed so bad it was horrible. I mean, I, it's a wonder somebody didn't bust me upside my head in public, some parent. And I cursed and I was vile. And I remember I used to like to wear expensive watches. Couldn't buy one now if I wanted to. And I'd go in this one particular jewelry store and I'd be so rude to everybody in there. So when I got saved, I had to go make reconciliation. See, I still believe in reconciliation. I am a minister of reconciliation, and I believe in making restitution. And so I went in to see them, and I there were no. I waited till the, all the customers left, and they kept looking at me funny. And I said, "Gentlemen, I said I've come to say something. I don't know if you know anything about this." I said. I want to apologize for the way I've behaved in the past and the way I've talked to all of you and your customers. I said, I've become a Christian. And I said, I don't act like I used to. They burst into tears. They called the watchmaker out of the back and he came out and they said, say it to him. And I told him he broke into tears. They said, we've been praying for you for years. They said, you were the rudest, most obnoxious human being we'd ever met. And we've all been set into praying for you. A lady at the dry cleaners told me the same thing. She said, I've been praying for you the whole time. You see, I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for people praying for me. I remember the year I got saved on the first day of the year, that year they had a gathering at my home church and they gathered and they prayed that God would save, and they listed off a whole list of wayward children. Starting that night, my life began to turn and go a different way. I didn't get saved for another eight months, but it started to go downhill, and things started going bad. Don't ever give up praying for your children. Don't ever give up praying for your marriage. Don't ever give up praying for anybody. If there's anything my grandmother taught me is as long as there's breath, there's hope. And so when I got saved, it was a new tongue. Instead of blasphemy and taking the Lord's name in vain and using vile words, I began to be kind. And I had a new heart put within me. It was a heart that was sensitive and sensible. In the past, I could not stand people to put their hands on me. I, I thought they were trying to do me wrong. And I couldn't stand anybody to touch me. You that all know me now know I hug and pet and baby on everybody. Because I got a new heart and I got a new speech and I'm singing a new song. The psalmist said in the 40th Psalm, he said, thou hast brought me up out of an horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock and have to establish my goings and put a song in my heart, even praise under our God. My nephew asked me about 10 years ago, and they said, do you worship all the time? I said, as much as I can, as much as I can. Now, I want to tell you, before I got became a born-again Christian, I worshiped money and drugs and sex and violence, and I was a rotten little creature. But he picked me up out of that horrible pit and the filth and the stench of it, he washed off. And he put my feet upon a rock, that's stability. He planted my feet upon a rock where I would be stable. And no, I never put my hand to the plow and looked back, but it was by the grace of God and by his work in me. 
I watched people that got saved with me take off like a zenith and pass me by. They're not even in the faith anymore. I think they liked the excitement of it more than to fall in love with Jesus. Great song by Jonathan Butler and Kurt Whalen. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing that I ever did. Best thing I've ever done. And very early on, I had a new song in my heart. He not only put my feet on a rock, that's stability, but then he gave me progress and he established my goings. And I remember when he gave me my first revival, he didn't give me one, he gave me eight in one day. And I quit my job and I started preaching and I never looked back. He blessed me to preach in massive churches, preach on the radio all over the eastern part of the country from Texas East. He put a new song in my heart. He established my goings. And I've been singing that new song. I woke up this morning just worshiping and singing. And while I was getting dressed, I started singing an old song. I used to sing it when I was a child. Here among the shadows in a lonely land, we're a band of pilgrims on the moon. Glory to God. Burdened down with sorrows and shunned on every hand. But we are looking for a city built above. And then I sang the chorus, come. Oh, Holy Spirit, and all our hopes renew again with newness. And then I not only sang a new song, not only had a new name, but I had a new commandment to love one another as I've loved you. Love one another. That's been the easiest thing that ever happened to me, and I hated everybody before I got saved. But see, he put a new heart in me, and he injected it with his word. And his word I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. And I began to love people. That's why forgiveness came easy to me when people did me wrong, because I knew that love would cover a multitude of sins. And so I loved. And I loved and I love some more. And then I want you to go over with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 changed my life when I first got saved. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll go down to verse 10. And having put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. My, my, he said, lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. We won't go into that whole thing, but see, he said, if you, if, let's go back to verse one, it won't hurt. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not of things on the earth. I love it. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. I'm dead to sin and alive unto righteousness. That's Bible. You're supposed to be. It's supposed to be a new thing, a new walk, a new sprinkling. I couldn't help but notice David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. He literally says a loyal, steadfast spirit. Did you receive a loyal, steadfast spirit when you were born again? I did. And I, I didn't want to go back. And then I, I learned very quickly, Romans 12, he said, that, you know, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto him. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then I saw James, my brother, said that if I received the engrafted word of God, that it was for the saving of my soul. And then I began to realize that my spirit was regenerated 
and my mind was being renewed. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Some of you need to get rid of some stinking thinking. Some of you need to get rid of some grinds in your mind and some grief cases you've been carrying and some unforgiveness. And I'm going to say it to you plain. Bible said if you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. It's just that simple. I don't care what they did to you. Forgive them. Get over it and kill it. And every time it rises up by faith, kill it again. Don't let anybody have that much power over you. Nobody ought to be able to keep you out of heaven. And then if it's not enough that I've got a new song and I've got new wine in my spirit and I've got a renewed mind, he said, in the end of this thing, you're going to come to a new Jerusalem. And he said, you'll have a new heaven and a new earth and a new self and a new commandment. And then I love it, Lamentations 3, 22, he said, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are fresh and new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And I thank God for his faithfulness today. I thank God that his mercy is new to me today. And everybody that knows me knows one thing. They say, when you talk about the Lord and him, what he did for you, it's as if he did it yesterday. I said, no, he did it today. He did it all over again. He renewed me today, gave me new wine today, reminded me of a new name. Put the song in my heart, a new song. I wasn't running around singing cocaine anymore. I was singing old songs that I'd learned as a child. And I was singing, oh, how I love Jesus. An amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I would sing old hymns like there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And with the new life came some new things. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Go back and look these up for yourself. I had a new aim, and that new aim was to please the Lord. I had a new association. I was so in communion with him till I wanted to be like him and be at one with him, oneness with him. Oneness in purpose, not to be God. Let's get that straight. But to act like God, to be an imitator of God, to think like God, yes, to live a godly life, yes, 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 yes. And my aim began to please him. And this is where I wonder with so many people. Either you've got to tell me that I'm a freak or this is what biblical Christianity looks like. To aim to please him. Do I always hit the bulls? I know that's called sin. And every now and then I do. And every now and then I fail. But I do not do it on a regular basis and I do not practice it. My question's always been this. Can you live right for five minutes? You can. Well, good. How about 10? How about 15? Can you make it a whole hour? And, and you know, they, they taught me when I first got saved to pray. And Oh, my Lord, I knew I found out something real quick. That when I pray, I would, after a while, I started learning to pray like this, search me and try me, see if there be any wicked way within me. Deliver me from the sin of presumption that it might not lead to the greater iniquity. Search me for secret faults. Check my intent and my motives. Is my motivation correct? Are my intentions correct? Am I walking in the fullness. What about my activity? Well, uh, my activity is that I walk by faith. I'm making progress. It is a walk. It is a plod at times, barely shuffling, but I am walking, making progress. And we live with him. My attitude totally changed. I'm a new creature. I don't have the same attitude I used to have. I don't have the same anger problem I used to have. And I want to say this to you. Quit making excuses for it and let God set you free. Let him deliver you from anger. And don't tell me what you do for a living cause it or you got a goofy spouse. Get it under the blood. Keep it under the blood. And you'll be free and you'll enjoy life a lot more. 
and heaven to gain at the end. And then there's my attachment to him. I'm fused by love in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5. Fused by love. I walk, activity is verse 7. I walk with him. Verse 15 is I live with him. I literally live in the presence of God. At any moment around any corner, I look for him to bless me this morning getting out of the shower. Bless me in the shower. He blesses me all the time because I'm a new creature. I am the temple that he abides in. He lives in me. We've said these things. We've talked about it, but there's been very little intimacy. Very little communion with him. Then I have an assignment. My assignment is quite simple. I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Now I want you to listen to me real good. I realized it Thursday, I've said it a thousand times, one more won't hurt. God only really wants one thing from you and I, that's you, me. He wants us to have such a fervent love affair with him until that's why sin bothers him because sin is a separator. And his son died for my sins. To wash them away, to cleanse me from them, and to set me free from them. And it's time we get the gospel straight again. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, once delivered unto the saints. And we are to contend for that gospel. It means fight for it if we have to. We must reestablish in the American church we, we almost need a new dictionary of biblical terms. What does it mean to be a new creature? What does it mean to be a new creation? What does it mean to have a renewed mind in the knowledge of him that created me? And the more of his word I get in me and the more of his word I let control me, the more like him I will become. And it'll be natural for you to heal the sick. It'll be natural for you to speak of him all the time. It'll be natural for you to cast out devils. That's part of the new creature. It'll be part of this thing to walk on serpents. And if you drink any deadly thing, it won't harm you. Victory is what it comes down to. And the average person, it makes me so sad, is not living victoriously. The average person is barely hanging on by a thread. And I've come to tell you today, I'm going to drop you a scarlet cord, not a thread, and you can hold on to it. And he will lift you up out of the miry pit. And he will put your feet on a rock. And he will establish your goings. And he will put a song in your heart. He'll put a song in your heart when the bottom falls out. Now, you see, before we were saved, we went around profaning his name and bringing shame to it. I don't want to do anything that brings shame to the name of somebody that loved me enough to die for me. And my question is, why would you? Why would you want to bring shame to them? You said, well, I don't want to. Well, you don't want not to. You don't want it enough to stop. It's time for the saints to stop sinning. And so there's a heart change, not a realignment, not a realignment of our thinking. But yes, my thinking will change and I'll think differently about sin and I'll feel differently about sin, especially mine. And I'll learn to hate my sin and love righteousness. I'll have my stubbornness removed. You know, God, every one of us needs a dose of that. And I'll have a childlike sensibility. So unless you become as a little child, you'll no wise enter the kingdom. And I'll live pure. Is your testimony one of purity? Is your testimony one of people say, well, I don't know one thing about him, but he lives it. I don't know one thing about it, but she lives that thing. She lives it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So he restores his presence to us, his peace to us, his righteousness. And he gives us a sensibility 
no apathy, no complacency, no disregard for his claim on my life, but an open ear and an open mind and an open mouth and tender conscience. He gives me humility where I'm not proud, but I am confident. And I remember the rock from whence I was hewn, and I remember the goodness of God all the time, and I reverence the name of Jesus. And it's not a problem to get me to serve anybody. There's nothing I won't do for people, and I trust him. I take him at his word. Not Billy Goat religion, but, 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 but. And I confess my errors and my faults and my shortcomings to him with one simple statement, I have sinned. And against thee and thee only have I sinned. And I don't sin in a vacuum. I usually hurt somebody else with my sin. And I don't like to hurt people. And I don't like to hurt Jesus. And so I have to cry out with David, wash me and I'll be clean. Create in me a clean heart and renew a loyal, steadfast spirit in me. And yes, I have my shortcomings and yes, I have my faults. And yes, unfortunately, I sin. But I don't practice it. When I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, even Christ Jesus our Lord. It means I've got the best lawyer in the whole world and the highest court in the land. And then there's the outward rectitude, loyal, loving heart. My speech is sweet. My words are soft. They're not that bitter, hard edge. I've, I've got family that specialized in that hard edge on their voice. They specialized in cutting you down and putting you down, wanting to put you in your place. That's not God. I've had people do that, not just family, but people do that to me my whole walk. And it'll be natural for you to bear fruit because you'll be connected to the vine and we'll have a heavenly communion that'll be without ceasing. And if there's anything I could give all of you today, it would be my prayer life, but I can't give it to you. I've prayed with most of you plenty of hours for you to know how to pray. Lay down before him, call him father, tell him what's wrong, ask him to fix it. Tell him where you failed, let him clean you up from it. And then begin to intercede for other people. And first off, don't forget to worship. When you come in, just come in telling him, you are the lily of the valley. You are the rose of Sharon. You are the chiefest among 10,000. You are the altogether lovely one at a pearl of great price. You're a shadow of a rock in a weary land. You're a covert from the storm. You are the great unlike one. You are my shield, my buckler, my high tower, my deliverer, my soon coming king. You're my master. You're my savior. You're my healer. You're all in all and you feel all in all. And I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus and I brought a brand new wine skin here today for you to pour in the new wine of the spirit. And I don't want to live a stale, broken down, what used to be life. I don't care what God used to do. I want to talk to somebody that he's doing something fresh for today. We used to sing that old song when I was a kid. It gets sweeter as the days go by. And I'm going to tell you something. It does to some of us. To many of you, you've gone through a form of godliness and you've denied the very power thereof. It literally says your life denies the power thereof. You don't live a powerfully free, pure, holy, godly life. But you have a form of godliness. You wouldn't miss church on for anything. You wouldn't miss paying your tithes. You go to your little daily prayer time and all that, but you've lost that original newness. And I have to say this to myself all the time. The first of those seven churches he addresses is, Eph is Ephesus in the Revelation. And he said, you got it all right, but one thing. He said, you have left your first love. 
You didn't lose your first love. You walked away, strung out over business, strung out over children, strung out over grandchildren. You've left your first love. So today we come back and we say, you remember when you first saved me? And uh, I just wanted to talk to you all the time. And I, I just wanted to worship you. I, I, they better not say anything about loving me because I, I just get stupid and squall my eyes out. And, and you, you remember the first time I, I gave you an offering, a cool, I thought that was that God himself would receive something from my hand or my lips or that he'd let me do something for him. I still remember the first person I ever led to Christ. I remember the first time I read he that winneth souls is wise. I've never lost that freshness. Some of you never had that freshness, so you need to examine and figure out why. I have no concept of a drudgery of Christianity. I have no concept of it being too hard to go on, and I've been through way more than most of you. All I have to hear is just a little bit of, there is a name I love to hear. And I love to sing his praise. And it sounds like music in my ear. Is the sweetest name on earth. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. I am a new creature. I pray to God you are, but I pray to God you would be honest with him and say, I need a fresh renewal. I need a new bath. I need a new direction. I need a new attitude. I need a new aim. I need to fill out my assignment and carry on the message of reconciliation. If you need somebody to pray with you, 678-472-9494, jubileeministries.org. You can send us an email or you can write us at Jubilee Ministries, 5009 Lake Miriam Circle, Lakeland, Florida. I want you praying for me. I'm going to jerk this jacket off and go pray for a woman. And I'm looking for a miracle. I love you all. I need your prayers when this service ends today. Please pray for Miss Carr. God bless you. And I love you. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day and minute by minute, I might add. God bless you and I love you.